say the word in their ears like say the word in their bones right every start and and hands on your voice for you will never reach 
live stream and you're just joining us, we want to welcome you uh, to Trinity Alliance Church. Uh, my name is Jeff Conley. I'm the pastor here at Trinity and uh, could not be more proud of the church that you are. Uh, I can't thank you enough. The service went so well yesterday uh, for Amy Bell, uh, all the wishes and everybody who, who came and just, uh, just loved on Mike throughout the, the past couple weeks. I can't thank you enough. It has, been, it has been awesome. It's been an incredibly hard week, like Kiri has said. There were two funerals this week, and, uh, and there's uh, even more that have, uh, more people who have passed. Uh, Bob, Matulovich, Bob Matulovich's brother passed away this week. It has been a very hard week. Uh, but as a church, you've surrounded each and every person, and I can't thank you enough for how you love one another and how you are more than just a, a group, you're a family, and you have been that way to me, and I've seen how you are with one another, and, and, I, and I love it. So do me a favor, open your Bibles to John 14. Um, we are still on course for our Christmas Eve service, so the governor has not called Trinity Alliance Church and said you cannot have it yet, so we are looking really good. Uh, we have two services that we're going to do to kind of split things up. We have a service at 5 o'clock. And a service at 6:30. Um, they will be a little bit shorter than than our normal Christmas Eve service, um, and we will be live streaming the second service. So hopefully, uh, some of you will say, "Hey, you know what? I'm going to stay home for Christmas Eve, and I'm going to invite somebody else over and watch the service online and uh, and do the Christmas Eve service with us." But in a much more intimate setting uh, with others that you might be able to connect with in a deeper way. So we've opened up those three different opportunities for you, so please join us uh, for Christmas Eve. There's sign-ups in the back so we know how many people are coming. We're pretty well balanced so far, so you're doing really well. Make sure you sign up or, or send me a message and let me know, and we'll make sure you're in where you're supposed to be. So that's all, all I have announcements live. So let's dive into into God's Word this morning. This morning we're going to be talking about peace. Advent is the time of year that we're in. Uh, it's the four Sundays leading up to Christmas, and the four Sundays we focus on the same things every year. Hope, peace, joy, and love. Because those are truly what we are anticipating, what we are, are, are looking forward to. That's what Advent means, what we're preparing for is hope that comes in Christ, peace that comes from Him, love that only comes from Him, and the joy that only comes from knowing Him. So, I want to deal with peace this morning. My question for you as we begin is a very simple one. Are you ready to hear what I'm, a, what, what I'm going to read, and are you ready to hear from God's Word? We're not always ready, are we? We come, we sit, where other things are rolling around in our mind as, as you hear somebody speak. It happens in school all the time. That's why the peanuts made their uh, teacher go wah, 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 because sometimes that's all we hear when we sit and we listen. I'm asking you to prepare your heart and your mind and ask God, God, will you teach me? Because peace is not something we are good at. Peace is something we chase all the time. And it seems like a ghost to us. We get so close to peace and it just 
disappears and, and we go chasing after it somewhere else. Last night it was never more than evident to me how quickly our peace can be just disappear from us. My son Malachi had spent the, uh, at least part of the afternoon cleaning his room and making his room nice. He's one of those very organized guys. Uh, I, he's probably going to be an architect. He loves to draw with rulers and just very detailed, very or- organized, loves his space to be clean. He's been building all kinds of really cool stuff, so his room kind of got out of control. They cleaned up his room. It's time for bed. He's laying down in his bed. He's all peaceful and quiet. And I, I head out of his room and I go into the living room. And I hear, I hear these feet. He has a loft bunk bed, so he kind of jumps out of the loft bunk bed. And you hear this as he comes running into the living room. And he is panting. And he is white as a sheet. And I'm like, buddy, you okay? And he's like not talking. I'm like, what in the world happened? He said, Dad, Dad, you've got to come. And I'm like, okay. I'm not sure if I want to at this point, but you know, you look terrified. Why do you want me to come into something? I don't know what it is. He says, Dad, there's a cave cricket in my room. Have you ever seen these things? You know what they look like. All right, so if you don't know what they look like, in your mind, take a cricket and blow him up. Now add all of the spider legs on him and these crazy long antenna. They look like the creepiest, li- they look like aliens and they get huge. So he is like, ha! Ah! So I go, I pick up a shoe, I go into the room and he's like, Dad, it's over there in the corner. Of course, it's in the pitch black part of his room, the corner of darkness. So I turn on my flashlight, and there it is. Now, if you know anything about these cave crickets, when you go to kill them, they do not jump away. They jump towards. I don't know why. I don't know if that's some weird self-defense mechanism, but I know it's coming. I know it's jumping at me. So when you swing at a cave cricket, you swing a bit closer to yourself than you expect. So I kill the cave cricket, I clean it up, because those things, when you kill them, they explode. They're really nasty, and, and they're, it's like alien blood goes every. it's just nasty. So I kill the cave cricket, clean it up, I put Kai to bed, and, I, and I'm like, all right, buddy, good night. He looks at me and goes, don't shut off the light. <laughs> I'm like, no, buddy, I killed it. You saw me. I mean, it's everywhere. It's all over your room now. And he's like, no. Don't shut off the light. His peace was gone. And I realized, as I've been preparing for this, we settle for a peace that we do not, that we do not even want. So let me read to you. We're going to read out of John 14. And let me read John 14, 27. This is what it says. And I... I misplaced my Bible with the big letters. So now it's a lot smaller. It's not as easy to read. I will find it this week. But this is what it says. And I'm going to start up in verse 25. It says this. All this I have spoken while I was still with you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, all of this I have spoken to you while I was still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not give, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. What an interesting group of things Jesus puts together here. Jesus says to them, listen, the Holy Spirit is, is, is coming. The, the, the Lord is going to give you the Holy Spirit, and he's going to remind you of all of these things. He's going to keep pointing you back to the way that I had, I had shown you. He's going to keep pointing you to, to me, and that's what you need. And then he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
Is it something we have to chase? Or is it something we just have to accept? Is it something that we have to earn? Or is it something that he just gives? See, our problem is we have settled for peace of mind instead of a peace that passes all understanding. Instead of a peace that comes from God and he gives it to you. It says one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace. It's a fruit that grows. It's something that is given and it grows in you. It is not something to be found. It is not something to lose. It is something that is there. Peace is not what we think it is. We have our mindset when we talk about peace. We don't want peace. We want peace of mind. We settle for what is the imposter of peace. And that's the peace of mind. That I just don't have to worry. If you uh, are reading Know the Word, we as a church are going through the Bible in two years all together. And, and we're using an app called Mission 119 uh, or Mission119.org. And you can go and join us. We're going to be in week 48. But this week we read a, an incredibly interesting book. The book of Obadiah. Most people don't even know where it is or even that it's actually in there. It is one of the shortest books of the Bible. It is super tiny. But this is the gist of Obadiah. Obadiah is, is God's judgment on Esau's children. The, the, the generation, generation after generation had grown up. These are, there's two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Jacob becomes Israel. His descendants become the Jews. Esau's become the Edomites. And the Edomites are not a really good people. They live up in the high mountains and, and they live uh, like their, their castles and their, their homes are built in the cliffs. And they are safe because nobody can get to them. Nobody can get to them. You can see your enemy coming from miles around. You can see all the trade that is going on because their cities were right in front of the trade routes. So they would be up on these safe hills in these towers that nobody could get into. And they had peace of mind. But God comes to them in, in Obadiah and says, you think you're safe. You have a peace of mind, but you're missing something. You're missing me. And they had taken, when Israel was coming, uh, when Israel was being attacked, instead of coming and helping their brother... They ignored what was going on, and when it was all over, went and pillaged what was left of Israel. And God comes and he punishes them. And that's what, the, that's what Obadiah is about. But there's a phrase in here that caught my attention, that got me, that got me shaken a bit. Obadiah, well, it's not really one, because it's just Obadiah. Verse 3. Or verse 2, it says this, See, I will make you small among the nations. You will be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks and make your home in the heights, you say to yourself, who can bring me down to the ground? Though you soar like eagles and make your nests among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. What is it that's their issue? The pride of their heart has deceived them. So what truly is this peace that we're looking for? We don't even know the peace that we, that we lack. We don't know the peace. We are, we are like them, trying to find peace of mind. We're trying to find something that takes away the stress that is in our lives takes away the fears that are in our lives. We want something that doesn't just take them away. We want something that makes sure there's no room for them. That is the peace that God gives. That is the peace that we have. But what is this peace? What is peace that Jesus is saying when it says that Jesus is the Prince of Peace? 
that he is the one who, who is going to come and bring peace on earth. Jesus came and he died. I don't see peace on earth, do you? So did he not do what he said he was going to do? No, he definitely did. We were looking for an incredible peace of mind. We want the heavens to open up. We want, when we accept Christ, for everything to just always be better. And then Jesus comes and says, you will always have trouble. <laughs> but take heart. I have overcome the world. And that's what we need to understand. That there is a peace. There is a peace that God wants to give his children. And we refuse to accept it because we don't know we even need it. And we say, no, God, please just give me peace of mind. There's so much more to peace than just not worrying. That's peace of mind. I want something that is in me, that has set me free, that takes away fear, that leaves no room for anxiety. Not something that can be easily taken in a moment's notice. If you look at the world today, you look at all that coron the coronavirus has exposed in our world, the one thing it has exposed is that we have settled for an imitation of peace and we, we don't have it. We don't have peace. So I need to talk to you then, what is peace? What is this peace that God is talking about? It begins with our relationship with God. It begins with us understanding and having a firm relationship with God. One thing that we don't get is how our sin affects us. We don't get how deep and how wounding our sin is to us at all, do we? And we don't even think about it. We don't think about how it affects God. We don't think how it affects us. We don't think how it's corrupted this world. But go back to the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, you had Adam and Eve, and they walked in the garden with God. Do you want to talk about peace? Was there anything? Was there any room for any fear? Was there any room for anything other than peace? Because they walked with God. There was no lack of peace. There was nothing, it wasn't missing yet. But we sin. And I want you to think of Adam and Eve as they leave the garden and they're out in the world where work is now hard, child labor is hard, the earth is cursed, there is sin that has crept in. We are now mortal. And we will die. There is sickness. There is disease. There is pain. There are things to be afraid of. There is all of that. Why? Because we have been separated from the life of God. Because we have become enemies of God. Because we have sinned. We have become objects of his wrath instead of objects of his glory. Do you understand that that's what we truly deserve? That that's what we have. That's what our sin, for the wages of sin is death. What we get, it is our payment for our sin. And if we don't think about that, we can't understand what peace really is. Because the heavens cracked open and the first thing the angels say is what? Peace on earth. Peace has come. Because they got it. They understood why peace was gone. And we're not just, again, we're not just talking about a peace of mind. We're talking about peace with God. We are his enemies. If you look at Obadiah, what you realize is that Edom had no idea that they had an enemy they could not run from. They had peace of mind, but that was going to let them down. Their pride in their hearts had deceived them. And we are in the exact same place as the Edomites. The pride in our lives has deceived us. We think we are good enough. No, do you understand you are an enemy of the living God? That you have sinned against Him and you are an object of His wrath. And you think 
if I just do a couple good things, I'll be good to go. He's a God of love, so he can't. He's also a God of justice. And he is a God who will be glorified. And sin does not bring glory to his name. And so we, we stop thinking that we are enemies of God. So when Jesus Christ comes and we talk about, we get to celebrate peace, we're not just talking about this, <sighs> yes, that's what we all want. We all want, that's probably the best definition of peace I could come up with this week, all right? I looked everywhere to try to find a good definition, and the only definition I have for the peace that I'm looking for is, <sighs> but there is something so much more than a deep breath and a sigh. There is justification of your sin, that God declares you righteous and he separates you, your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. You are no longer an enemy of God. And get this, get this, you move from being an enemy of God, an object of his wrath, to being an object of his grace, and he adopts you as his child. Think about that for a minute. He takes you from being an enemy, from being one who is deserving of wrath. And he comes and he says, no, I'm going to take you as mine. That's peace. We are at peace with God. We are no longer at war and at enmity with God. We no longer have to run. We no longer have to hide. We can now accept the love that he wants to pour on us. And he says, not only am I going to pour that on you, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you joy. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you all of the things that were taken away because of sin, because I was not in your life. But now that you have life, through Jesus Christ and through him alone, then Jesus can say, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. Do you understand a little bit different of a kind of peace than what we're looking for? Because we come to God and we say, God, will you just take away our mourning? We don't want to mourn anymore. This has been an incredibly hard week. This season has been incredibly hard. How many people at Trinity is this the first Thanksgiving, the first Christmas without someone? That's not peace, is it? My peace of mind is gone. God, just take away that hurt and that pain. And God says, no, I'm not going to take away the hurt and the pain, but I'm going to come and give you something that passes all understanding, that goes beyond your peace of mind, goes beyond your understanding and goes straight into your heart. I'm going to fill you with something that takes away all of that fear and all of that anxiety and doesn't take away your pain, but will be with you in it. That will be there to comfort you. What a God we serve. What an amazing God we serve. And so when we get to that part where we say he is the prince of peace, we're not just talking about being the prince that just makes you feel good. We're talking about the prince that comes and makes you no longer an enemy of God, but a child of his, a beloved, dear, fully accepted, fully loved child of God. That's what you are if you accept his love. Peace. Peace that a cave cricket can't take away. Peace that a pandemic can't steal. That you are not an enemy of God. Why don't we shout that from the rooftops? Why is that not written on our t-shirts? I am no longer an object of wrath. Well, that makes God sound bad, doesn't it? No. No. It makes me sound really bad that I was an object of wrath, that that's what I deserve. And out of nothing I can do for myself, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins because God wanted to hand me peace. The other myth that we believe is that God kind of puts 
uh, uh, piece on a string that just keeps pulling it away from you. That's not how God is. He died on the cross so that he could give you his peace. It is not something he's trying to pull back and forth from you. My peace I give to you. Let's look at uh, a couple more things. All the way in the end of your Bible, Revelations 3. I know there's a Bible study going through this, so I wanted to join, join you guys in here. There's a, a men's group that meets on Saturday that, uh, that have been going through some of, the, some of the things that God says to the churches. And in Revelations 3, I want you to hear what he says. Now remember, we are blind. Our foolish, prideful hearts have deceived us. Like it says in Obadiah. Now this is what he says to the church in Laodicea. We're looking at starting at verse uh, 14. These are the words of the Amen. The faithful and true witness. The ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, and I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. Is that our goal? Peace of mind? To get to a place where we we don't need a thing? Is my goal peace without needing God? Is my goal peace that I can create so I don't need him? That's what he's saying to this church. He's saying you're you're lukewarm. He's not saying I wish you were either really bad or really good. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you've become worthless. You've become worthless because you have settled for a peace that isn't peace at all. You have settled for something That is not me. He says, you have gotten yourself to a point where you say, I don't need a thing. I have riches. I've acquired wealth. I have peace of mind. He says, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked because your foolish heart has blinded you. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and them with me. What is he talking about? Do enemies sit down and eat together? This is that picture. You are an enemy. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You deserve wrath because you have settled for something less than God. It has become your God that you don't need me. So if you don't need me, then you are my object of wrath. He says, but you, your foolish pride has blinded you and you don't see it. So come, come to me. I stand at the door and I knock. If anybody opens the door, come, come, just open the door. He's not saying you have to do anything, just accept it. Just take what he has to offer. And then he says, then I won't be your enemy, and we'll eat together. We will celebrate together. We will have communion together. We will be family. You will be my son. I will adopt you as mine. He says, two things I want you to get. One, it's that we are easily deceived. You talk about one from the Old Testament Talk about a nation who was deceived by the pride of their heart to fall for a fake peace, a peace of mind that they chased after and they found in the rocks. But it's just a peace of mind. It is not a peace 
that wells up inside your soul. And they settled for that. And then we get all the way to the end of the Bible. We get to Revelations, to the church of Laodicea. And he says, even you have forgotten. Even you chased after a piece of mine. And you have forgotten me. In Jeremiah it says, my people have committed two sins. Only two. You have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And dug for yourself cisterns. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. When we chase after peace of mind, that's a broken cistern. That's chasing after something that will always leave you empty. And God says, I just have a peace for you. Now, I know some of you are sitting there saying, I've followed God for a long time. Where is this peace? You have to understand your sin to understand that you have peace. You have to understand the depth of what you have been saved from to understand the peace that you have been given. So if you are one who's sitting there saying, well, I don't feel it, that's not the peace we're chasing after. We're not pe- chasing after a peace that's a feeling. We're chasing after, and we don't even have to chase after it. We have been handed peace, which is a relationship with God. Do you have A relationship with God? Or do you have what everybody else has done? Made God into a cistern instead of just going and living in Him and Him in you. He says, You have forsaken me, the spring of living water. How hard is it to get water from a spring? It's not very hard. (laughs) You can just put your hand in it and drink. You can stick your face in it if you want and drink. You will always have water. God says peace flows from him like a river if we are in him, if we are with him, if we are in relationship with him. That's what we have. But if we are chasing after, I must do, I must be, I must have, you're missing it. The last thing I want to tell you is this. That too often we lose that peace because we are so busy doing. And in this season where we are busy and we are chasing after everything out there, you begin to realize hurry, hurry in our lives, busyness, if you want to call it, is the enemy of peace. It is the one thing the enemy uses to distract us because when we have hurry, we need to eliminate things that cause that lack of peace and we chase after a peace of mind instead. And God says, shh, relax. Be with me. Enjoy him. Love him. It's a relationship. It's not a performance. It's not what you have to do. It's not all the things you have to collect. It's not a scavenger hunt that you have to get right or you don't get. It's a relationship. God wants you to enjoy Him, and He wants to enjoy you. Is that what your week looks like? Is that the week you have planned? God, can I just enjoy you this week? Or do you have a lot of other things planned? You can enjoy him in work. I desperately do. The youth group, I think, learned a couple weeks ago when they went and and raked leaves. I think they realized you can enjoy God while you work hard. We can enjoy God in, in, in the things we have to do. But there's a time where we just enjoy him. Is that your goal? Or is it a chasing after a peace and a hope and a love and a joy that you will never catch. Chase after him. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Peace be with you. He has left his peace for you. He gives it to you. The Holy Spirit pours it into you. It is a fruit that comes when you just enjoy a relationship with him. I want to close by just asking, 
So many of us have come to church for hundreds of years. <laughs> right? This is what it feels like for me. We come and we perform and we do and we do and we do. But I would be lost if I did not ask you, do you truly have a relationship with God? Do you really have that relationship with Him? If you do, enjoy Him. If you don't, it's not something that has to happen. It's not something that you have to go figure out. He says, just come. He's knocking at the door. And he says, if you open the door, I'm, I'm right here on the other side. It's not a whole lot of work to go find him. And many of you know right now that God is knocking on your heart. And I ask that you close your eyes and you say, God, come in. I open the door. Will you begin a relationship with me? Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Can we begin this relationship? Can you teach me? Can you give me that Holy Spirit to, to help me walk? That's it. There's nothing magical. There's nothing that we are waiting for. He's knocking, and he always has been, and he will continue. Today, will you open that door? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, peace, a peace that comes from you, a peace that indwells in us, a peace that is actually filling and cannot be taken, a peace that we see in so many of the champions of our faith, that in the hard times they sit in prisons and sing, they're being martyred and they rejoice in your name. Because they have a relationship with you and there is nothing else we need. Your grace is enough for us today. If it weren't enough, you would have given us more. God, bring your peace here. Allow your fruit to grow in the hearts of every one of your children. And Lord, if there's anybody here who has not allowed you to adopt them, because the pride in their heart has deceived them into thinking they're okay. Father, will you humble them today and open their eyes and give them ears to hear. What an amazing God you are. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.